And the next topic we're going to talk today about is market efficiency. Market efficiency has multiple meanings. The first meaning is how efficient a market is, as its name suggests. There are three ways to judge market efficiency. One, we call it operationally efficient. Uh, and a market is operationally efficient if it has very low transaction costs. It is easily to tra easy to transact without having much price pressure on the assets. The second, and the one we'll speak most about, is informationally efficient. And an informationally efficient market is one that incorporates all information into the prices. And we'll talk a lot about this one today. And the final one, which is in some ways the most important of all of them, is allocationally efficiency. Allocational efficiency is the idea that we're putting money into the right investments. So as a society, are we investing in the right things? Um, and this is, in, while it may be the most important, it is in many ways the most difficult to measure because we don't see what we didn't invest in. So we don't know, had we invested somewhere else, what would have happened. Um, a lot of the research here is looked at in countries where they have more of a fiat system, such as the former Soviet Union, and the evidence suggests strongly that markets work very well here, but we don't really know, and clearly they're not perfect. Sometimes we do make mistakes, but it seems that markets are the best way to go here. What we will do is spend most of our time talking about informationally efficient markets, and because of that, I want to just start off with the traditional view, and this comes from the idea that there are different information databases or information sets, and each set, it has different information. So for example, we might have an information set or an information database with all past market data. So we would have stock prices, we'd have stock volumes, we would have you know, days of the week, etc. All of this would be incorporated in this database. And if it is in this database, and we use that information to price securities, the market is said to be weak form efficient. Now, weak form efficiency is the starting point for all of our discussions. Essentially, as Fama suggested in his 1990 paper, what we're looking for is if returns are predictable. So can we, for instance, use technical analysis to predict future, spot, future prices? Can we use uh, any regression analysis to predict future prices? Can we use correlations to find future prices? And if so, we have a problem because the market then is not weak form efficient. The next information database we're looking at is public information, public data. And public data is a very, very big database. It includes everything. It includes everything that is in past data, but it also includes such things as newspaper publications, analyst reports, uh, company press releases, uh, you name it. You find it on the internet, you read it online, you read it in the Wall Street Journal, etc. It is in there. It's already priced if the market is what we call semi-strong form efficient. There's, there's a big debate about this, and we'll talk more about it in a second, but th this is where the real controversy lies. Is our markets publicly Sorry, try that again. Are markets semi-strong form efficient? Does public information get incorporated? As Fama suggested, this is tested largely with event studies, but we'll talk about those in a few minutes as well. The final information set, or the final database that we're looking at, is all data. So this has private data as well. And I will state for the record that markets are not strong form efficient. We can just cross that one off the list if you want to. They are not. We see that all the time. Insiders beat the market on a consistent basis. Insiders who have better information than us beat the market. So therefore, that information that they have is not priced yet. As a society, we have made the decision that we are willing to live with some inefficiency to have the market seem or be more fair. And that's why we have laws against insider trading and the like. When we do look at this, uh, insiders can trade legally and illegally, and in both cases they make money, they consistently outperform uh, all other investors. So uh, we're willing to say that the market is not strong form efficient. This, this, is, this one is not the case, so we know that. What we do want to do is test these other two forms and see a little of how, what the evidence suggests. Are our markets weak form, are our markets semi-strong form? So to begin off, we have to think how we're going to test it. 
And some of these tests go back for a long ways. Uh, tests of weak form efficiency back to the early 70s suggested what we're looking for is are they statistically predictable? Can we find a way to use past market data, the stuff that's in this database, to predict future prices? And there are some, we're, we're, some easy ways. For example, we look for serial correlation. Serial correlation is correlation between different time periods. So if the market is up or if a stock is up in one period, will the stock be up or down in the next period? And there are different ways of doing this. One of the early methods was what's called a runs test. A runs test looks for the number of upticks in a row. So for instance, that would be an uptick, that would be an uptick. That is one run because there are two together. That's a downtick. That stopped that run and started a new one. And, you know, you could do something like this across the board, and you would find uptick, uptick, negative, downtick, downtick, uptick, downtick, etc., etc. Well, it's much like flipping a coin. We can run the numbers, and we can figure out the number of runs we should have, and compare that to the number of runs we do have, and see if, in fact, it's a fair coin. If we saw something like this, where we had a lot in a row, and then you go back, and you have a lot of the other in a row, and you go back and forth, that looks like, and it is, a case of serial correlation. It's positively serially, cor serially correlated. An up move is likely to be followed by an up move. A down move is more likely to be followed by a down move. And that's, that's largely what early tests suggested, that we had more runs than we should have, uh, longer runs than we should have, and we don't have the flipping back and forth. So it doesn't appear to be quite random. This was enforced later with uh, a, a one-step-up test, which is it's called a, a filter rule test, or a filter test. And what we do in a filter test, a filter rule, is we decide, so here's the stock price going through time, and we decide to buy if the asset or if the stock is up by let's say X percent, whatever X is, we make it really, really small. If it goes up by X percent, we buy. And we hold on to it until it goes down by some percent. We'll call that Y. If it goes down by Y, we sell. So we buy, we hold it, we sell when it starts dropping. It's based on the same idea. The idea that up moves are likely followed by up moves and down moves are likely followed by more down moves. The problem with this is that it leads to a lot of trading. To be successful, you want X and Y to be very small, and you want to be able to get in early and get out fast, and that's going to lead to a lot of transaction costs. Early tests with ignoring transaction costs find that you can beat the market using this. Uh, then when they included transaction costs, we had problems, and it went away, and market efficiency was, again, uh, sort of validated. However, now what we're seeing is that with some of the you know, the very fast trading that in and out without very, uh, with very low transaction costs, you might be able to jump in early and get on the wave uh, in, in a method, is sort of in a way of um, front running, not legal front running still, but still front running where you get in before it goes up. It does, however, is very contingent on how low your transaction costs are. The average investor is not going to make money doing this because it's going to be trading all the time. It increases taxes, etc. But ignoring that, this might be a way for some people to beat the market. What that suggests is, while the market is probably close to weak form efficient, it is not completely weak form efficient. And I think that's the story we're going to take from all of these, that the market is not perfect. I, I have never once claimed markets are perfect. Markets are very tough to beat. But there are possible ways of beating them. And this, for instance, would be one. It, it might work at certain times and if your transaction costs are low enough, but realistically, probably you're better off looking elsewhere and doing other things than trying to beat the market at micro moves. Um, the other way that people have tried to use this past database to beat the market are what we call technical analysis, or in what we call technical analysis. Technical analysis, or often sometimes historically called chartists, are people that try to beat the market. They try to look for patterns in stock trades or in asset moves. The pure technical analyst doesn't even care what investment they're looking at. All they want to see is patterns. They look at moving averages. And so here's a stock price going up and down. Here's a moving average. We'll put that in a different color. Here's a moving average. 
And what the suggestion is, is that whenever, and I drew this incorrectly, but whenever you go through a moving average from above, so you go down, that's a bad sign, you should probably sell. If you go through it from the bottom, so we'll go over here, We'll just extend this moving average a little more. When you go through coming from below, that's a buy sign, that's a good sign, and these technical, anal technical analysis suggests that the market price will continue to go up. The evidence historically has been very bad on this. Most people cannot beat the market doing this. In fact, uh, academic evidence suggests that this was nothing short of voodoo for much of our time uh, that we've studied markets. There are two facts here. One, they still exist. might just be from a marketing perspective because it does lead to a lot of trades. But secondly, I think we have to ask the question, if I knew something, if I knew a way to beat the market, would I give it to an academic to let them go and publish it? So the answer is probably no. More recent studies from 2009 when we used bootstrapping and other things suggest that this is a way to, again, at least at times make marginal profits because what you're doing is you're capturing or you're preventing some of the, the boom and bust that you see and when people get overly optimistic in different time periods. So technical analysis, by and large, again, is not a way you're going to make millions of dollars probably, but it might have a role in a broader picture. Fundamental analysis is still the way I believe to go, but I'm not discounting this completely. Fundamental analysis largely takes place in the realm of our public database public database, semi-strong form efficiency, both talking about the same thing. And here we're talking about does the market incorporate new information, earnings release, what happens to the stock price, etc. This is tested with what we call event studies, which will, do, will be the feature of another video later on. But an event study is essentially how fast markets react to new information and do they do it correctly. Without going into all the details, I will tell you markets get it right most of the time. They react very, very quickly, and they incorporate new information on average very well. Um, so that's when we put a piece of information into this public database, the market reacts. The question might become, and the, the more interesting question I think is, do they do it all the time? And there are times clearly when something doesn't get in priced correctly. And finance professors make a living on that. We report all the time about such and such an anomaly. But before we throw out the idea of semi-strong form efficiency, I think we have to remember that finance professors are paid to report things out of the ordinary. It would be very much like watching a newscast. If you watch a newscast tonight at home, you're probably going to see a fire or an accident or something. You're not going to see the norm. You're not going to see this is Mr. and Mrs. Smith, their house did not burn down today. You're not going to see this is George Jones, and George Jones just drove home from work today and saw nothing out of the usual. So that's not news. So when we do see all of these studies about such and such method beating the market, I have to remember that there's a good chance that that's the exception, not the rule. And if markets work, as soon as we report something like that, that abnormal return should go away because investors will trade on that new news. The final form, and we'll, we will come back and talk more about semi-strong form in another video. The final form is strong form, and I don't know anyone, I don't know if I could find anyone on the face of this earth even to believe that markets are strong form efficient. Insiders beat the market. Legally, insiders beat the market illegally. Prices, things we don't know, uh, we can't price, and if we haven't told anyone, we're not seeing the price move. So, I think it's very strong evidence that suggests the market is not strong form efficient. There is private information out there that is not priced yet. Uh, and those with that information have a competitive advantage. We've seen that on insider trading against the SEC, or you know, with SEC bringing charges against both hedge funds and corporate insiders. But also we even see that recently with the case of Congress, and Congress having competitive advantages because they had information that wasn't publicly available and making trades on that information. So we see that market is not strong form efficient. The debate is whether it is weak form and strong form, and my answer to both of those is they're, they're very good, but they're not perfectly efficient. We'll talk about one explanation for why that may be in our next video, which is going to be on behavioral finance.